else can hear him in Twitch? Um, let's improvise one. Let's put it down. I'll try something else out. I'm very, very quiet. I can hear myself, but I, it's it, it's a very barely hear myself sort of thing. So if you're able to hear and understand me on Discord, I can't hear and understand me. It sounds like I'm hearing something. Check, 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 check. I can hear, uh, I can hear myself coming through your side. Is that coming on the stream? It's a little bit better. It's a little bit better. Am I under, am I, uh, am I intelligible? Try my best to speak up as long as it's a little bit better here. Thank you everyone for hanging out through that. A little bit of an echo from Discord. I think uh, I think they're getting that handled here. Yeah, no worries. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you. Let's see, uh, let's see what's happening. All right, we'll uh, we'll go with that. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take it from here and see how things go. But uh, again, my name is Rainer72. Uh, I'm here with Tabletop Game and Hobby. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a miniature artist here out of the Kansas City area. Uh, I primarily do Twitch and things like that. Uh, so you may or may not know me. Uh, just depends if you've probably been here on Twitch. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting started. This is my first opportunity to teach some uh, teach some skills, some uh, painting techniques with you guys. So um, I'm going to take you through some basics. I'm going to take you through kind of a short outline of uh, some things that I think you need to know going into airbrushing. 
and uh, I'd like to take some questions and if you'd like to follow along with what I'm doing that'd be great if you uh, if you have any questions as we go make sure you hold on to those questions and as we uh, as we go through uh, we'll, we'll have a period for uh, for Q&A so I know there's going to be a lot I may answer some of those things along the way uh, so hopefully there's that if you do have um, if you do have an airbrush and you'd like to follow along uh, go ahead and get your airbrush out um, if you have the manual that's also important to have with you uh, you can go ahead and fire up your compressor get out your paints your materials etc what you think you might need and I'm gonna go through kind of a brief laundry list I guess of things that you should know when you're first getting an airbrush so uh, just to get started uh, what is an airbrush it's kind of silly right so it's a uh, it's a brush that relies on air to propel paint um, it's pretty simple uh, works on kind of a um, I've been told it's not entirely accurate but a, a sort of vacuum effect that's caused by the air running through the airbrush and pulling a slight amount of paint out through a very small chamber that's controlled by the needle that's probably the part you're most familiar with um, so it's a, it's a pretty basic tool but as you're probably already aware if you've looked at airbrushes you can get kind of pricey there's a lot of things to look at a lot of compressors a lot of uh, parts a lot of different airbrushes so it can get kind of uh, get kind of overwhelming so the first thing I would say is if you're looking at getting an airbrush um, kind of jump in at whatever you feel comfortable with you don't necessarily have to spend a whole lot of money or anything like that the basic components that you will need uh, you'll need a source of air uh, I would suggest getting a compressor. Canned air does get pretty expensive pretty quickly, and those kind of airbrushes that rely on canned air uh, tend tend to not be appropriate for miniature painting uh, for that reason. Uh, also, for just the extended amount of time that you paint with them, it's just it's no good. Uh, the other things that you'll need is obviously an airbrush itself. You can get an airbrush for somewhere as cheap as fifteen to twenty dollars. Those airbrushes do have a tendency to have low quality control, so you might find yourself with kind of a bunk airbrush. Um, it's known to happen, so it's just a warning to put out there. Um, some airbrushes uh, that I recommend for a lot of starters start anywhere between fifty to a hundred dollars. Um, this is a this is a good opportunity to get a lifetime brush. That brush can be used forever for priming or for base coats as long as you take good care of it. Uh, one of the other things that you'll need, you'll need a hose. So those basic three things will get you airbrushing. Then obviously everything else comes with it. Paint, mediums, things like that. Those are all whatever. It, it, whatever will go through the airbrush. Um, other things that you might want to get before you start airbrushing. The one thing I always point out to people, get a holster. If you've never seen an airbrush holster, I wish I had one just free that's not bolted down to my desk. Uh, I've got cheap like $7 metal holsters that just bolt to my desk. You're going to have to put your airbrush down and normally an airbrush has a hose or a container or something on it uh, that's going to be a problem uh, if you just try to put it down on your desk. So that's one big thing that I tell people to get. Another thing that I tell people to get um, some sort of squeezy bottle. I love these angle neck wash bottles because these will allow you to squirt water into the airbrush. Um, this is a fantastic tool for cleaning your brush while you're painting as well as when you're done. And another thing to look at, and this is kind of debatable, so you, you might hear some uh, back and forth on this, some cleaning tools to clean out the inside of the brush. One thing people warn about are the traditional wire brushes have metal in them which can scrape the inside. You may want to avoid it, but I find just being gentle tends to not damage it too much, but it does accumulate over time. Regardless, that's too much for now. Let's move on. Let's take a look at the actual airbrush itself. So the first thing I always tell people to do when they first get an airbrush is to take it apart so they know what it what it looks like when it's been taken apart um, before it gets full of paint, before it's full of water, before it's a mess, before something's broken, right? You're going to need to know how to take it apart. So the basic parts of uh, an airbrush, and this is what we call a, uh, a gravity-fed airbrush. Uh, we're going to look at this. A gravity-fed airbrush is going to be most appropriate for something like miniature painting. You, you'll, see something, uh, you'll see something like a siphon feed airbrush, which has a small bottle that hangs off the uh, bottom of it. That's not very appropriate for what we do. Uh, it tends to need a lot of paint to fill that siphon, and it's a little bit more appropriate for larger-scale art projects. Um, you might also see some that come in from the side. Those are a similar type of gravity fed. They just they have the cup in a different spot. So the main things with the gravity fed airbrush is that we have a cup on top, the paint goes in the top, and it uh, literally just slides down in there via the force of gravity and uh, 
it gets pulled out along the bottom. And in fact, if you look deeply down in here, you can see the needle down inside the cup. And it's kind of gross in there because, well, it's, uh, it's just a bit mucky in there. This is kind of just use and abuse through the years. So <clears throat> the other parts that you'll want to be aware of, uh, this is the main chassis here. This is where the air comes in. I've got a quick disconnect coupler. This makes it very easy to uh, get the airbrush on or off. But if you don't have one of these, which I would suggest getting, um, you'll need to unscrew the uh, the hose right here. So this, the hose will screw on and connect right here. Um, besides that, this is the tip. This is where the needle comes out. Be very careful of the needle. Not only is it very sharp and you can stab yourself, obviously you don't want to damage that. If you damage the needle, you can cause paint to, uh, to spatter to accumulate, to cause bad things to happen. You can ruin a paint job, so that's the most important part not to damage. Um, besides that, we have the trigger, and the most important part to point out on this trigger is that we have a dual action trigger. So with a gravity-fed airbrush like this, what that means is that uh, when you push down on the trigger, it releases air. So more air comes up and out of the brush. Oops. When you pull back on the trigger, it releases paint. So push for air, pull for paint. So the entire process is a combination of pushing and pulling on the trigger. That makes it a dual action uh, trigger. So you'll kind of get used to this as you practice, but what we're gonna look at today, uh, you won't need to worry too much about finessing this, but this is something that you'll get kind of a feel for, how your brush works when you start playing around with it a little bit. Uh, one of the main things to point out before you uh, get too far, like I said, taking apart your airbrush is important. Know that you can take off the back of it, pull the needle out, and you'll want to keep that nice and safe. The, uh, the tip of the airbrush, this, this kind of varies between airbrushes, but I'm going to give you kind of a basic uh, breakdown of what this airbrush looks like. And this is actually a little bit messy. I thought I'd clean this out better. <laughs> Go figure. Um, this is the tip assembly, so this is the cap. This is where the tip actually goes in. And then this is the brass tip that's inside. This is where the needle actually uh, resides. So when the, uh, when the airbrush is together, the needle comes through the tip like this. Oh, I have a messy airbrush. Tip comes out like that, and when we pull back, it comes out, and the paint passes through through that little tip. This is literally all an airbrush does. And then air rushes around this and pulls that out. So that's what our airbrush looks like when it's somewhat apart. Um, when I go to clean this uh, fully, I'll take this all apart. And uh, just clean the parts with mostly water. Uh, a lot of people will go ahead and get some airbrush cleaner. That's not a bad thing to have on hand. It's not necessary all the time. One of the big things that I point out to people is that while you're using the airbrush, if you ever have an empty cup or you're not using the paint anymore, immediately empty the brush and fill the cup with water. So cup, trigger, tip. Those are the m most important things to know right now. And that's the, uh, that's the most important parts of the airbrush, period. So, moving along. Let us keep going here. Uh, just making sure I'm not missing anything. All right, and uh, again, one big mention, most airbrushes come with a nice manual. If they don't, make sure you look it up on their manufacturer's air, uh, website. Uh, it's a great thing to have, having part numbers just in case anything breaks, uh, knowing how things go back together, etc., is a good thing to know. Because even though one brush may look one way, another brush may have very different parts. It just depends. These are different manufacturers. They have different parts, different specifications. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's always just good, good information to have. So, let's start taking a look at actually uh, painting, putting paint on a miniature. And one of the most important things that a lot of people ask me about uh, is I want to get an airbrush to prime. When you're looking at uh, getting an airbrush, this is probably the most economical reason straight up to get an airbrush. Um, not only is it pretty fast, pretty quick, and very thorough way of getting uh, Getting, air, uh, getting primer onto a mini. If you are looking at saving a couple of bucks, um, I, 
can't remember exactly how much I paid for this, but this is literally a quart of Steinol Res Primer, and this thing is amazing, and it goes miles. It just goes miles. So airbrush primer, whether it's Steinol Res, Vallejo, I think AK has a, uh, a version. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what uh, Tabletop has in stock right now. I think mainly Vallejo. Um, it, uh, it, it's much cheaper than Rattle Can, and since you're not spraying it onto a mini, you can also get into all the nooks and crannies without worrying about, you know, just wasting a lot of primer. So, most primers are meant to be used uh, straight or just thin down with a little bit of water. I believe Vallejo recommends a little bit of water. Steinol Res is just straight out of the pot. Make sure that you mix up your primer quite a bit. Um, there are different kinds of uh, colors of primers, etc. cetera. Uh, the big three are you're gonna look at your chromatic stuff. Just Vallejo, that, that makes sense, thank you. Um, I will say that 99% of my priming is usually black, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, the other 1% is probably gray, and I have white primer for the off chance that I either want to do a white prime uh, with some sort of wash technique, or to, or to use this with a um, um, uh, pre-shade, a zenithal prime, which you might have heard of. Uh, but there's better ways to do that, so this hardly ever gets touched. Uh, normally I'm using these two, black and gray. There are colored primers out there. Um, I think Army Painter has some, um, Stano Res has a few, etc. Um, those are those are fine too. The big difference, and I want to point this out, between primer and normal acrylic paint is that primer has a bit of polyurethane in it. Uh, that polyurethane or, uh, or that cocktail of uh, uh, binders in the paint itself helps that bind to things like metal, plastic, and resin a little bit better than just putting straight acrylic on a mini. So you can put straight uh, paint onto a mini without primer, but you do run a risk of chipping, especially if it's handled, mostly in the sense of games. So um, uh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, so that's a uh, it's kind of one of those questions, do I need to prime something if I can just throw paint on it? If you're doing something that's for a display and never going to get touched, yeah, you totally can. Same same question for varnish, too. A lot of people ask for about varnishing with airbrushes. Um, you don't need to varnish if it's not getting touched, but gameplay minis, I would very much suggest doing it. Uh, I do tend to rattle can varnish things. However, um, you can do it through an airbrush. The one thing I will warn you is you have to be extra clean about it. Um, we do have a question about cold weather affecting Steinol Res. Uh, I've heard that a lot. Um, I've heard some back and forth. There were some issues this past year with Steinol Res being affected by cold weather. I think it was freezing in transit and separating out. Um, I haven't had any personal issues with any frozen or uh, cold, cold or hot affected Steinol Res. I will say it does separate out pretty easily, so I have to shake the crap out of it. That's why I have a small bottle for my black primer uh, versus the big bottle. Uh, it's much easier for me to shake this up and then refill this uh, from the large bottle for later. So it, it does the emulsion does tend to separate, but no issues yet. Um, that being said, I have had friends who have been affected by it. So I think it's a mileage may vary sort of thing. I think some people just got lucky and some people didn't. Um, other things to cover on primers, I don't think there's too much there. Uh, one thing that I did mention um, that's probably going to come up here a lot with people asking about airbrush priming is zenithal priming. Uh, what that means in a nutshell, and we will show you what it is, is kind of doing a pre-shade technique, and I usually refer to it myself as pre-shading, uh, since zenithals technically, I, what I've been told, is an angle, a specific angle, whereas pre-shading you can really do any sort of angle. Um, so let's take a look at doing some priming first, and I'll show you some basic ways to do it. So I, I picked out a few example minis here to work with and tolerate uh, tolerate with me. Uh, my camera's upside down. I have to get a better mount for this particular setup so I can physically flip my camera, I think. Um, but uh, hopefully everything's visible, and if anything's not uh, not terribly visible, let me know. So I've got a uh, I've got a nice little chibi miniature here, and then I've got something a little bit larger. So we'll show you a couple of different ways to prime here. And um, 
Here we go. So if you can hear that, I've got my uh, airbrush compressor charging up right now. Uh, I'm loading up one of my uh, one of my airbrushes at the moment. I'm using an Awada Eclipse uh, HPCS. This is a uh, 0.35 needle. Now, one thing while we get this going that I get asked about a lot is what size needle I should get. A 0.3 needle is a really good, a 0.3 to a 0.4 is a really good size for anybody, uh, for all purpose stuff. Anything smaller is usually a detail brush and works much better with things like inks or very thin washes, uh, things like transparents, etc., that tend to not have solid inks or solid pigments in them. Uh, they do tend to gum up a little bit easier just because of the smaller aperture. So that is the thing. Here's another big thing uh, people will ask about, and this comes into play with priming. I just put on a mask. You might be wondering about ventilation with an airbrush. So there's a couple schools of thoughts on, thought on this. I have kind of an enclosure here, but I have a bit of a stream set up. Uh, this works as somewhat of a hood and contains most of the dust that comes out of it. This paint that's coming out dries midair and creates a fine dust. It gets everywhere. It's gross. Now I'm in a room, but I do have uh, I do have a window with a uh, filtered air conditioner, and I also do have a freestanding filter here to get ambient stuff. For my own protection, I wear a mask while I'm airbrushing. The, the dust in the air does tend to settle. I'd very rec much recommend, no matter what kind of area you're in, be very cleanly, whether you need to dust, whether you need to, air, uh, whether you need to vacuum, etc. That's a fantastic idea as much as possible. If you want to create your own hood or buy a hood, there's a, there's a hood with ventilation and stuff that will allow you to push stuff out to a window. That's a fantastic investment. Uh, the lights on it tend to suck. I'll just point that out. You can also make hoods out of cardboard boxes, which are great for containing the particulate. Uh, the particulate is the main danger, I would say, with acrylic paint, since most of them are non-toxic. Um, primer itself has polyurethane in it. You really don't want to breathe that in, so it's a good idea, definitely, to wear a mask with that. And if you are doing anything with solvents, um, which is outside of the acrylics normally, things like varnish and stuff, definitely have outside ventilation, have have external ventilation, have something that's rated. Uh, this, this is technically rated as an N95, but it's not quite an N95 mask. Um, but you'll want to have something, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it indoors. I would go out to an outdoor garage or something like that. So I just want to point that out. Uh, that is a danger. That is a concern. Um, and uh, read up, especially on, on on the specific things that you plan on using. And uh, you know, if you don't feel safe, hey, you know, take as many precautions as it takes. It's uh, it, it is your safety. It is your health. So. That being said, let's take a look at a couple of different primer options. So I mentioned uh, before we can prime in a few different ways, and I've pulled out a couple of different minis. I pulled out a uh, I pulled out a small chibi mini here. This is a mini from the uh, the Kickstarter Monstro, and it's a uh, it's a small human fighter. He looks very gutsy, and uh, he's been cleaned. He has been washed in water, etc. So before you do anything with uh, airbrush paint, you very much want to wash resin, especially. Uh, most plastics and things like from GW are fine without washing. I'm sure you're probably already aware if, you're, if you've been doing mini painting up to this point. But uh, airbrush paints are very sensitive to it, especially primer will peel right off if there's a bit of release agent on there. So make sure you get that, uh, that cleaned off. Um, so... Like I said, we're going to mix our paint. I've got a nice little mixer machine to the side here, so I don't have to throw out my elbow. But I'm mixing up my black primer. I've got some Steinol Res primer. Now, like I said, I don't need to mix this with anything. Vallejo, I believe, requires, or says to mix with a little bit of water. This can also be mixed down with a little bit of water as well. But uh, I don't need to mix it with anything at all here. So uh, one of the things that I have done and I like to do before I start airbrushing is I like to put a little bit of water into the airbrush to just kind of wet the noodle, wet the noodle, wet the, wet the needle, weird slips, and uh, just get a little bit of water into the cup and I spray that to the side. And this is also a good chance to make sure that the water itself is coming out of the airbrush. So I don't know if you can see the, the water on my glove there. But uh, I know that the uh, I know that everything's clear. We're good to go. Let's go ahead and put the primer in there. I'm putting it right in the cup. We don't need too much, but I'm going to be doing more than one mini here, so let's put in a little bit more. 
So one thing I'm doing over to the side is whenever I put a paint in, I want to get the paint out. I've got a small, uh, this is just part of a paper towel and I use this to spray on. Uh, always good to have on the side, kind of like what you might have with a, uh, with a normal brush. And then on top of that, um, Oh, cool. Uh, I'll load it up. So, there we go. We've got our Stano Res Primer out. And uh, this is the fun part. This is where we just blast it on. So, we can take it pretty thick. We don't want to take it too thick. But I am literally just pressing down the trigger and pulling back. And you should see a little bit of paint accumulate. It's black on gray here. But we're going to slowly let this accumulate on our figurine. So I'm pulling the trigger maybe halfway back, but I'm pushing it down all the way right now. I want all the air possible, but I don't need to push all the paint. Oh my gosh. Tabletop. If uh, if you haven't seen Joxel's work before, he's amazing. He also streams on Twitch. That's how I found these minis. We painted up a few of them last year, too. Uh, I've got a few more. They're gorgeous. I don't know if he. I don't know if he has any. Uh, I don't know if he sells through anything, but uh, really good dude, gorgeous sculpt. I have a cool Cyclops that I want to work on as well. <laughs> he did a. Uh, he did a kind of a Dragon Slayer s or a Goblin Slayer s miniature. Now you can see that some of the some of the paints globbed up a little bit. That's not a problem. We're just gonna let that dry, and one of the things that we can do. Is just push a little bit of air through the airbrush and that'll help that paint dry just by pushing air over it so we're gonna paint a little bit and then we dry a little bit we paint a little bit we dry a little bit this is where airbrush this is where airbrush priming takes a little bit more time but it's a little bit more thorough because you can tell that we can make sure that all the nooks and crannies get cleared or get uh, covered, and um, we're good to go. Now, what I should have done was pull out my hobby holder, like I had to the side, and use that. But uh, there we go. So that's our first mini prime. We just put a put a nice black primer coat on him. Not an issue. Now, what do we do at this point? Do we throw paint on him? Can we? Steiner Res, I believe. Let's see. Let's let's check. This is always the best part. No thinning necessary. I'm gonna have to read another bottle so you guys can read this with me. Uh, no thinning necessary. Shake well before using. Right, right, right. Uh, best applied with a 0.5 millimeter. So we're actually using something a little bit smaller uh, at 20 to 30 psi. If you're curious, I'm running at 30 psi. When I say you push down for air, if you don't push all the way down, you don't get the full psi. So that's something to keep in mind. That's part of the part of what you want in an airbrush like that is the ability to control how much air is coming through, as well as how much paint is coming through. Um, uh, shoot, uh, let dry five to eight minutes, uh, or three minutes if dried with an artificial heat source like a hair dryer. So in uh, in a, in about ten minutes, he should be ready. And then we can start applying paint. Now what I like to do is I usually like to le leave things to dry for multiple hours if possible. Um, if I'm in a bit of a rush, uh, I can go ahead and start painting them. But it is nice to leave things uh, to dry for a while. If you don't let this dry, the polyurethane primer itself can actually peel up. It tends to stick to itself before it bonds to the surface. So you'll get peeling. The, the actual paint will just come across in like a kind of a sticky, gummy surface. It's not good. So we'll put that to the side, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and work on something else. So one of the things that uh, one of the things that we talked about was zenithal priming as well, right? Let's pull out a slightly larger miniature, and uh, with this miniature we can um, we can play around with a little bit more zenithal priming. It's got a little bit more texture to it. So this is what zenithal priming is about. When you're looking at a uh, when you're looking at a figurine, whether it's uh, something real, uh, whether it's something that's uh, that's 
that's been drawn, uh, etc. You'll notice that light hits certain areas, right? And that's what we try to emulate with miniature painting. We highlight raised areas. We uh, we shadow. Uh, we shade recesses, etc. Um, Pre-shading, zenithal highlighting, etc. Gives us a way to sort of cheat the system with the with the airbrush. One of the things that I like to tell people is to think of their airbrush like a flashlight. If you if you drew a very basic flashlight, if I drew here, this is this is the best part. Right here, if I drew a very basic flashlight right here. Right, I've got a flashlight. Wow, look, I'm an artist, right? Um, and I said, cool, let's turn that flashlight on. Click. It's going to project a cone of light based on the uh, uh, based on the little uh, reflector inside, right? And it's going to give us a nice little cone. This is just like an airbrush. In fact, this is now it's an airbrush. Same thing. So think of the tip of your airbrush as a cone. So when we uh, when we go to when we go to airbrush this, if we keep the uh, airbrush at a certain angle, um, it's not going to hit everything because of the way that the miniature is uh, shaped. So what we're going to do at first is we're going to hit this with some black primer, and then we're going to hit it with something a little bit lighter to uh, to show you what we mean. So I'm going to take this very quick. And yes, this is a very big and very weird creature. If you're wondering, this is Dorgacon from Judgment. Uh, he is an infernal demon of some sort. So, not sure his entire backstory. Probably, probably fussing and a feuding, as demons do. I get a little crazy here. I'm not too worried about the Steinal Res layer. Airbrush paint tends to dry very thinly. So uh, when we're applying this, we're usually thinking about very thin, very fragile layers. Uh, that, does, that does apply with primer as well. Primer tends to dry very thinly from an airbrush. Uh, trying not to muck up the details. It's a fantastic... Uh, fantastic tool to have. I'm going to roughly prime in the, the base here. So you can see we don't have to take too much time, but I am going over the individual areas. I'm throwing a lot of air out here. We're hitting places multiple times. Very basic. Nothing crazy. We're good to go. Now, one of the things that you might encounter while you're priming. Uh, primer tends to get a little chunky in the brush. Um, there's a few there's a few issues that pop up. Oh, this is probably a bad, bad example. This brush tip is actually a little screwed up. Um, you'll get gunk that uh, accumulates on the tip. I'm actually taking the tip assembly partially off here. Um, don't ever touch the tip like this. I'm using this to show you guys as an example. That can gum up right there, and that can cause a clog. What happen, What do you do when you, uh, when you get a clog like that? There's a couple of different things. One of the ones that I would uh, take a look at first, you can uh, take the back off of your airbrush, loosen the, uh, loosen the nut on the needle, and you pull the needle back and push the needle forward. If there's anything stuck right here, and you see a little bead of paint right there, hopefully, um, that will clear that little gunk, and then you can spray it right out. Um, one of the other options uh, with a, with an airbrush like this that has the uh, full cap, some people like putting their finger on the cap without pressing too hard, minding the needle, and that will cause air to come back through here. Um, be very careful, it will bubble and splatter, but if you're very careful, you can reverse the flow of air and also clear a clog that way. Uh, one of the things that I like to do, and this is a very important tool, uh, this is a toothbrush. This is a fantastic tool for all sorts of things. I paint with it, and I airbrush with it constantly. 
I like to dip it in a little bit of water. I stick the tip of my airbrush in it. And then I move it back and forth like that. And that will knock off any of the loose paint in the tip. Uh, does that damage the needle? I've yet to damage anything. So I will just put it that way. Um, toothbrush seems to work just great. I use this for all sorts of things. It's just a normal soft bristle toothbrush from my dentist. Oh. oh there's something coming through. Let me go ahead and hit this real quick. Actually, yeah. You know what? I'm not even going to worry about that. We're going we're gonna to do something else with that. Uh, let's go ahead and get out. Let's use this. So, uh, one of the things that I said earlier about zenithal priming, when we are looking at doing the, uh, the shading part, is that a lot of people don't use white primer. They use something else. And I would also highly suggest this. Um, I've used gray primer a lot. That works very well. It doesn't give you a stark of a, uh, a stark of a contrast. Between the black and white, that is okay. Um, a lot of people will also suggest white ink or something that uh, that uses something similar. If you have not used inks before while you're painting, inks use a slightly different kind of pigment that's more liquid than um, than uh, fine grain powders. Um, inks can be airbrushed. In fact, smaller smaller needled ink uh, smaller needled airbrushes are really optimal for inks or optimized for inks. Uh, you can use them on your miniature, so it's a great, great thing to use. Um, but one of the things that people do is that they use um, they use inks for their pre-shading because it flows so smoothly and it doesn't speckle nearly as much. So, if you've ever run into chunkiness, chalkiness, etc., with lighter colored paints while you've been painting with them uh, with a traditional brush, uh, you'll probably experience chalkiness, powderiness, etc with those same kind of paints with an airbrush. But there's some things we can do to avoid that. So I've just loaded up some white paint. Um, I literally just dropped some of this white paint in here and it's mixed with a little bit of white ink already. Um, and I mixed that with uh, something called Flow Improver. And we'll get back to this in a minute. But another tool that I have is an old brush. Um, warning, this will scrape the inside of your cup. Some people don't like that it has a metal ferrule on it. Um, you can find a softer tool for it, but I like mixing stuff in the cup with a brush. So that's a good tool. Other people like mixing it in something outside of the cup. That's completely up to you. So, we've got something that now airbrush is white. And it doesn't have to be strong. It just has to do white. So, let's do a, let's do a fairly top-down zenithal highlight. So, I'm airbrushing, I'm pointing straight down at the top of the mini, right here, and I'm oh, I'm turning on my air or I'm turning on my flashlight. So that cone of that light is slowly appearing. It's like the world's slowest flashlight. And I just keep this angle consistent. Check to see if I have enough here. I'm trying to keep the same angle even when I'm moving down the side of the model. All right. So I'm taking it very thin, very slow very easy. Uh, part of that is to allow the white paint to dry as I'm applying it. And part of it is I don't want to get too crazy too quickly. I want kind of a grayscale effect. So this is what we get when we zenithal prime. Now, why is this a good thing? Um, there's two things you can kind of do with this zenithal prime or appreciating that uh, that can help you out as you go through your uh, through the rest of your painting process. Um, you can either use this as a um, you can either use this as kind of a kind of a color by numbers sort of thing where you can see 
Um, actually, I want to hit him a little bit more on his back, uh, even though part of his back is going to be covered. Uh, you can see where the light's supposed to hit, and just start painting where you know it needs to go. Or, you can use very thin, thin glaze layers, whether through an airbrush or a traditional brush, to use the uh, to use the value that we've set down. So let oh man, I don't have it anymore. I don't own the minis anymore. Uh, one of the things that um, oh shoot. Uh, one of the recent projects that I just did, I painted a trio of Minotaurs, and the way that they were painted, they were previously Zenithal Primed. Their entire skin tone was done with a Zenithal Prime ink. So the chestnut ink was done more top-down on the lighter parts, so that it gave it a like an orangish-brown tone, and then the shadowy parts were toned with violet ink, and that violet ink gave it a, uh, a rich shadowy tone. So that's kind of that's kind of in a nutshell what Zenithal Prime you can do with it um, and where you can take it. So that is perfect. So at this point, um, I'm done. Uh, I'm done with the airbrush. I'm done with this paint. Um, I don't. I don't want to use this anymore. In this situation, what do I do? How do I clean this out? That's a fantastic question. So I do kind of a, I kind of do a, a, a quick and dirty method. Um, that's where my squeeze bottle comes in very handy. Um, what I would recommend to get started is uh, disconnect your airbrush, uh, go rinse it out under the sink. Um, Shown, it's kind of hard to describe um, but the big thing that I like to point out is never let anything sit in the airbrush that's not water so once you once you're done with a paint uh, put it to the side fill it back with water spray a little bit through if it's milky that's fine but nothing is drying in there that's that's the important part oh Are we still having issues with audio? No. Oh. We're still good. Okay. Okay. As long as it's okay. Cool. 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 Just want to make sure. All right, cool. We can continue. So that kind of brings us, I think we're about on target, kind of uh, on target for priming. The next thing that I want to go into, we'll start in a little bit, but I kind of want to open up to if anybody has any questions at this point, uh, kind of some of the basics of airbrushing or, or airbrushes and or priming. I know we've kind of gone over a lot. I'm also just trying to think if there's anything else that I might be missing here that might be important. Um, so if we want to open this up, see if anybody else has some suggestions. When we get back, one of the uh, one of the next things that we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, doing an actual base coat on a mini, and we'll talk about how to load your load your airbrush with some actual paints. So I'm going to break out a simple, uh, simple marine. It's a bit dusty.
and we'll get him loaded up and I will show you some base coding techniques. trying to think of some other things that uh, we could add to our list as well that I may have missed. One of the things that uh, somebody brought up to me recently that you can sometimes forget a little bit uh, with airbrushes, make sure you have Teflon tape on hand. If you are unscrewing or adjusting any of your hoses or any of your gear, um, you'll want to you'll make sure that it's sealed. Uh, a lot of people use Teflon tape. Uh, other, a lot of people suggest using beeswax for helping with seals it's, and things like that as well. So that's kind of a, a basic cheap thing. Uh, I usually end up with like a bunch of extra Teflon tape from random projects, so I just reuse that. Uh, there's no problems with that. I don't think we have any questions or concerns so far. Uh, do we want to keep it going or do we want to go ahead and hit the break here shortly? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a take a quick break, and then once we're back, we'll pick it up. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll show you guys how to how to use some of your your everyday paints. And by everyday paints, I mean things like uh, well, I've got some P3 paint, some Citadel paint, etc. Through your through your airbrush.
All right, welcome back, everybody. So, after that exciting break, you can see my, my lovely art here. Um, we're going to get to doing some base coding. Oh, make sure I actually mute my audio output there. So, guys, we've got a very simple Marine here. I've got a nice little Mark III Marine. It's been... Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's been pre-primed here, just with black primer, Nothing's, nothing crazy, uh, just the same simple style res that we've used before. So I'm going to show you right now it's just a, how to put down a, uh, a very basic base coat. So let's say we want to make this guy a, I don't know, an ultramarine. How about that? We we'll want to paint him blue. Um, normally what, when I start planning out a scheme for a... Uh, a color uh, a color way that I want to work with in an airbrush. Uh, I'm normally thinking about it in a uh, like a base tone, a mid tone, and then a highlight tone. So in this case, I'd, I'd probably use something like this. Um, I've got uh, Vallejo Dark Prussian Blue. I've got Pro Acryl Pants Blue, and I've got Pro Acryl Faded Ultramarine. Um, but the basic thing that we want to focus on here is the base coat. So we're going to get out some of our Dark Prussian Blue uh, now might be wondering, hey, if you're using normal Vallejo model color paint, it's perfectly fine. That is okay. Um, a lot of people ask if you need to buy airbrush specific paint. You do not. Uh, any paint can be an airbrush paint if you blow hard enough, is what I've heard. Uh, so it's kind of a factor of whether or not it's appropriate to go through an airbrush and how thin does it need to be. Uh, Airbrush ready paints, things like Vallejo Model Air, Citadel Air, etc. They kind of come a little bit pretty thin so that they're a little bit easier to push through a brush. But they're generally the same sort of, sorts of pigments. There might be slight differences in formula, um, but there's not too much else going on there. So that being said, you can take something like Vallejo Model Color. This by itself would be a little too thick. <clears throat> uh, you can thin this down with a little bit of water. Uh, if you do thin it with water, you run the same risk as you would with thinning your paints with water on a palette. Uh, it can get chunky, it can get weird. Um, mileage may vary. The things that most people ask about in that case are going to be airbrush flow improver and airbrush thinner. And most people assume that they want thinner. Uh, I would highly suggest that you get airbrush flow improver. Uh, flow improver is a, is a bit of a drying retardant. It will slow down the dry time on your paint slightly, and airbrush thinner will speed up the dry time. Now, that's secondary because the main point is that you actually want to thin out the paint without the pigment in it chunking up and the emulsion becoming unusable. Uh, both of them do that. So it's really just a factor of what works for you. Now, a lot of people ask how much do you need to mix in. I can't really give you a good, I can't tell you mix 50% this, 50% that, and it will work every time. Um, but I can give you some rough ideas of stuff. Uh, for this, I'm probably going to use at least 50% of flow improver and 50% paint. Um, and when I load the paint for just a single model like this, I'm only going to need maybe two or three drops of blue paint. So about two or three drops of blue paint and two or three drops of flow improver, and we'll mix that together. If you're painting along with me at home and you're wanting to try some things out and you don't have flow improver or you don't have thinner, that's okay. You can try out some water. Uh, I would generally not say to, to try to airbrush thicker paints through without them, but some things are pretty okay. Uh, I've noticed army painter paints are fairly thin. They can go through an airbrush uh, okay. Uh, same thing with reaper paints as well. So if you want to try out some of those and you don't have anything to thin it with, that's not a bad, that, that wouldn't be a bad idea. But uh, now's a good time to go ahead and try to load up your airbrush. I'm going to do the same. And like I said, I'm going to use a little bit of Flow Improver. Uh, I'm not sure if... I know I've bought Flow Improver and uh, Thinner out of Tabletop. I'm not sure if they have the big bottles at all. Uh, it would be... It would be nice. I definitely use a lot of it. Um, a lot of people use homemade recipes for things to thin stuff out. Let me warn you ahead of time. Um, those do work. It's fine. It's a great way to save money. The one thing I will tell you to never ever use, never use ammonia-based Windex. Some people use Windex. Ammonia will damage brass. 
So that's a never ever sort of thing. Uh, there is ammonia free Windex. Uh, it's just, uh, it's not made for this. So um, out of all the homemade stuff I can get behind, um, glycerin and water is probably your best bet. So I just want to point that out there. So I've mixed up my paint in there. You can see the kind of consistency. I'm going to go ahead and put my mask on at this point. You don't need to get too crazy on uh, mixing things up. You just want it to be a nice, even consistency. There are people who will say that you want a consistency kind of like, you know, the, the old milk analogy. You want it sort of like that. Um, again, I, I think it's more mileage may vary. Uh, a little bit of trial and error. You'll, you'll see what certain brushes can do and what certain brushes like as well what certain certain paints do um, but you want it fairly thin you want it thin enough that it blows on through so i'm going to test it out here just by blowing a little bit of paint right here and uh i usually have either a paper towel something like this this is literally just paper that i'm painting on uh, it's good to check your paint before you go to paint on the mini always open up your brush away from the mini don't uh, don't don't point at the mini and then spray. You can cause uh, specks of paint to come off of the airbrush and hit your mini, for example. So it's a good thing to check, make sure everything looks good, and then we'll get to painting. So let's actually put some blue paint on this guy. So I'm pushing this down all the way, the trigger here, and I'm pulling back maybe halfway. And you can see that I'm slowly building paint. And I'm going to do that same thing on the mini. So I'm going to open up, and then I'm just going to slowly pull back the trigger. And while, I'm, while I've got the paint going, I'm going to slowly move the paint around and cover the rest of the mini. Now this looks pretty similar to the pre-shading that I did earlier. Um, that's just kind of the style that I have. You can go for a solid coat. You can start building where you want your colors and your highlights. This is kind of wherever, wherever it leads you, but I tend to go slow and easy. One of the reasons that you want that is that as you have these nice thin layers, you get to let them dry and build evenly. You don't get any splotches or uh, splatters. Uh, there's a few things that can happen. Um, if you are, let's give you some examples. If you are, let's say you're spray painting. Uh, actually, let's get out something a little bit more visible. All right. So we've got, some, uh, we've got some blue paint that we're working with here, right? And you can see I've started painting him blue, but he's not super blue yet. That's okay. And we're still building. We're taking it nice and slow. Um, you can take this part kind of as quickly as you want, but uh, part of the reason that we take it slow is if you get uh, pools of wet paint, you can actually get a texture on the mini, which you might not want, especially over smooth panels and things like that. So if you just build up too much paint, you can see you've got a small pool. And when this dries, it will uh, it will actually have a texture, a ridge around it. Uh, the surface will also be bubbly, etc. Um, it will cause bad things to happen. So I'm just running some uh, running some air over it. It's kind of quick in that drying, but you can see how long that takes to dry. This also poses a danger if you accidentally touch it. So that's one potential problem. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to come in. Oh, I'm a little uh, little clogged up. I'm going to take it to the side. I'm going to open it all the way up. Yep, all the way back. Now I'm good. So full air, all the way back, all the way forward. That'll clear clog, clog as well. So, this is more what I want. And you can see that I'm kind of slowly radiating out. And then I'll let that dry. 
I want it to dry before I continue on. And again, start the airbrush out here while I'm not pointing at anything and do that. So that's more what you want. Um, other things that you might run into. You might run into like speckling, which will look something like that. So you can see how we've got some speckles around the edge. I'm kind of forcing it a little bit here. Um, that means that you've got your paint drying between the airbrush and here. Um, so either you need to add flow improver uh, to keep it from drying or you need to actually just hold the brush closer. And remember when you hold the brush closer you might actually have to get the, uh, get the pressure down because if you're too hard with it, especially when it's thin, can't force it here too much. It's not, it's not the right kind of thinness, but you'll get a, uh, you'll get a spider webbing where you'll get, uh, it'll look something like this. You'll get, uh, it'll, it'll look like splatters flowing off and little beads of, uh, paint will go running off. Uh, that means you got it too thin and you're applying too much air and it's literally just blowing the stuff around. So you want to try to take it low and slow. So it's drying as you apply it. That's ideally where you want to be. So let's get back to our mini then, since we're talking about uh, applying a uh, applying a base coat. So we already started applying some blue uh, blue paint to them. We've got plenty in here. I'm gonna I'm gonna clean the tip again with the uh, with the toothbrush. And uh, I'm using it low and slow again. So you can see I'm actually testing on the base. And I'm not so worried about zenithal pre-shading or anything from a specific angle here. I just want him to look mostly blue. And this is a very dark, rich blue. The cool part is, if you're looking at doing gradients, if you're looking at doing some of your shading and stuff, you can start here. Remember that you're, especially with uh, acrylic paints, acrylic paints are going to be translucent. The paints that you're laying down now uh, can be visible underneath the paints that you lay, lay down later, especially airbrush layers since they're so thin. Chaos Maverick, absolutely. Uh, I have not changed the PSI. The only the only place that my PSI is changing at the moment, Maverick, is uh, is at the trigger. So I'm mostly going full blast right now, but sometimes I'll take it just a little bit easier. You can hear that maybe. But yeah, um, it's very rare that I go back to my compressor and adjust it at this point, but that's mostly out of practice with the trigger and the brushes that I have. Um, if you, if you do need to get a little bit closer to a miniature, say you're trying to do something that's very detailed and you're having, uh, you're, you're not confident you can get in there and have good trigger control at the time, take it down a couple notches at the compressor and, uh, test it out. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to, it doesn't hurt to adjust it at the compressor. And some brushes have some nice little stops in them to help you adjust how much paint flow you have as well. So there's some things to help you out as you uh, as you start getting used to how things feel. So I very much suggest uh, uh, you know use use any and all tools. All right. So we're gonna go back in here. Pick up a little bit more of this dark Prussian blue. And I'm just getting it on the legs, getting it on the arms, etc. So here's what the lame part about airbrushing is. Um, this is basically it. If you're looking at how to speed up your your painting and stuff, um, this is this is kind of where it stops. Uh, everything from here on out makes your makes your paint job usually take a lot longer. Um, 
I, when I'm when I'm talking to a lot of people about my airbrush projects, ninety percent of my time is spent with a traditional brush after I've done my airbrushing. Um, that first ten percent of my time, though, is knocking out like ninety percent of the flat surfaces, the gradients, setting up all the undertones and everything. Um, you know, getting getting the mini ready for the rest of the techniques that I'm gonna do. So that saves an immense amount of time, but uh, <clears throat> you know, if you're just saying, "Hey, all I need is a blue base coat, I'm good to go," this is basically where you're at. Now, I was talking about um, how I would do it. I would go up through a couple of different uh, couple of different colors. So if you want to see how I take it up through a gradient, we can do a little bit of that because I think this is kind of important to show. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we had been, this is probably a good point to show it. Let's 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 give you guys a good comparison mini here, since we've got it set up just perfectly. Now, if we had we had been painting this miniature, the uh, the one that we had Zenithal uh, highlighted before, with the uh, the blue, we want to take this blue very thin. So I'm actually going to thin it down a little bit more than what I have. And we'll move on to the blue on the marine here in a moment. But I want to show you what this looks like when we uh, when we do a pre-shade. So this is where taking it very easy on the trigger comes in uh, most important. Because you want to barely pull back and get the, just the smallest amount of paint. And we're going in from the same angle. Now, a lot of times what I, I will also do is instead of uh, this kind of shading, uh, glazing with a traditional brush, just getting a little bit of little dirty water glaze or a uh, little bit of slow dry, a little bit of flow improver, etc., and just going in and hitting this, that will also work. But this is, this is the technique that goes a little bit beyond just making this kind of a color by numbers setup. And this is what an airbrush makes very simple. This right here. So in three steps, this mini now has maybe 80% of the shading and highlighting that it needs. And then we can just come in and start hitting it with the... Uh, hitting it with our detail work so we can start breaking it out we can say hey I've got you know I've got armor and stuff to hit here he's got a skirt he's got some skulls a weapon you know pick out those details and then enhance the skin so at a certain point uh, you'll want to start playing around with um, manipulating the colors that you've airbrushed but uh, for now just focus on trying to get Try to get basic coats down and get that kind of thinness and get a, a try to get used to working in very thin layers. Uh, it, that will help you uh, immensely as you're working with an airbrush. So there's that. He is suitably uh, zenithal primed. Nice and easy, super simple. We're not make, gonna make it complicated. Let's clear out our airbrush, and I'm going to work on our marine again here. So I want to show you how to do a gradient. Um, the other way to work your value up instead of doing a zenithal highlight with an airbrush, I find, is to work up through your different layers at the same time. So a lot of people, when you're looking at, especially things like GW's uh, system, they're, they're kind of three colors and shade. Um, P3 system, their their triplets, Reapers triplets, etc. Um, you can kind of think of airbrushing in the same way. So you can use those same exact colors, those same exact triplets, in kind of the same same ways. Um, don't be afraid to use the same techniques, the same ideas, and the same concepts uh, as your normal painting. I think one of the one of the important things to remember is that the airbrush is not another discipline, it's just another tool in the same discipline. So all the same same stuff still applies.
So to give you an idea of what this looks like, we've, we've loaded out some of our pants blue from Pro Acryl. And I'm going to take this super thin again. You can see that building up on stream. And we're going to build up very slowly in very small spots. We're not so slowly. Oops. So if you're following along at home, if you're wanting to try out something like this, uh, one of the things to point out too is that, especially when you're doing a gradient or you're transitioning through colors, you don't necessarily need to get all the paint out of your cup. In fact, you can mix some of the previous paint in to make that transition a little bit smoother. Um, it is it is helpful. So if you're worried about wasting paint, A, don't use a lot of paint. Use a lot more thinner and medium. It'll stretch your paint way out. I only use a drop or two at a time normally. It's not much because you're also going in very thin like this. Now, this is also similar to what we did with the Xenophil Prime, where I'm kind of taking it at an angle, right? So you can kind of see where the two two approaches to this kind of cross over. We're, we're, we're building light. So again, our airbrush is acting like a flashlight. We're just slowly building light. And you can see that uh, he's, he's getting a bit brighter on the top sides. We're kind of assuming a more vertical light here. Okay. So again, if you're wondering what, what size needle am I using, this is a 0 .5, 0 0.35 needle. The size of needle doesn't really determine how detailed you can get. It determines how wide the spray is. So just keep that in mind. Um, doing details doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily require a tight aperture. So just taking it nice and thin down the sides, nice and easy. This is how fast we're building it. If you can see that building on the paper right here, super slow. And what I will say is, if you're practicing like this and you're doing things slow, eventually you're just going to speed up. That's okay. It's okay to get faster at this. Just make sure you take your time and uh, hit all the spots you need to, because it really stinks having to go back through and touch some stuff up that you, you missed. It happens. It's not a big deal. It just stinks. <laughs> So I want to show you something a little bit, a little bit different here as well. Um, another concept that I think everybody should kind of understand, and I'm trying to think because I don't really have a good piece to work on with this. Uh, I was trying to find one, and I was trying to get. I, I want to give you an idea of it. This is something else that I want to show you when you're when you're building your base coats. So going back to the concept of that zenithal highlight and airbrushing, uh, one of the other advantages that you have because it acts like an airbrush is that when you, I'm taking a piece of plastic that I've just been painting on and stuff. When you paint over an edge, the way that this airbrush, this this light goes, if you were uh, if you were just if you're just shining this light over this, it wouldn't touch this edge. For example, so if I was shining a light this way and this is a solid object, there would be no light here. The airbrush works the same way. So you can do some really neat things, especially on larger models. But the same thing just happened here on this model as a part of our uh, as a part of our highlighting. Now you don't necessarily need the zenithal highlight to do that. So one of the great things that I like showing people is that you can build some really interesting um, shades and stuff and textures by shooting the tangent. So you come in on the angle of attack a little bit different 
hopefully you can see what angle I'm going at here. And now I've got a nice crisp edge along that plastic. So you can make these nice crisp edge just by the way that you, uh, you abuse the topography of the model as well. So just keep that in mind as you're going. If you're wondering why you're getting weird edges, weird shadows, if you want to know how to avoid that, or if you want to know how to abuse that, start playing around with the angle of attack on your airbrush. So again, it, it, it wor it's a cone. It's a slow flashlight. It's going to slowly reveal the paint job. So there we go. Good blast. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay, cool. Um, what are we doing on time? I think we're right on. So I'm going to I'm gonna do one last small highlight. And I think I've gone over most of the things that I want to go over, except I want to obviously talk to you all about cleanup, etc. So if you have any questions, if you have any more uh, things to throw my way, I'd love to hear them at this point. And we can start rounding those down. And then I will, uh, I will, I will break down my brush and show you how, kind of an idea of how to clean it and make sure that things are maintained. So I'm getting out a little bit of my faded ultramarine. Uh, like I said, I like to think about a lot of airbrushing and uh, triplets. So if you're thinking about doing gradients, having uh, having somewhere between two to three different colors is great. Um, and you can use the same kind of color colors that you'd normally use in your uh, in your tradition with your traditional uh, painting. So don't worry there. That shouldn't be a problem at all. All right, let's get some spot highlights on this, just real quick. So we've got a much, much lighter color. I'm going to take this much thinner, much lighter. We're going to clean the tip again using our airbrush. Again, I'm doing this little technique, which I can't do anywhere near my minis, but i got to show you. It's going to knock loose paint off of there. You don't want to do it hard. You don't have to do it hard. All right, we're going to take our faded ultramarine. We're just going to hit a few spot highlights here. One of the things that a lot of people wonder about is what is, you know, what's the advantage of a, an airbrush? And can I can I do this sort of stuff without an airbrush? The biggest answer is yes. Um, you, you absolutely can do the same thing that I'm doing without an airbrush. And if you can, you're, you're doing great. You're ahead of the game. Um, the good news is if you're still thinking about getting an airbrush after asking yourself that question, you're adding another awesome tool to your arsenal that you're going to have a blast with. So, I'm going to point this out real quick. You notice this edge here along his visor, this uh, hard edge. Oh look, we shot the tangent. We made a nice little fade here. This side is brighter than this side, even though both sides are blue. So that's one advantage that we have. So now we've got a nice blue ultramarine. He's ready to go. We can start working on his trim from here. Nice Mark III armor, ready for some uh, for some post post heresy, pre heresy action. It's good times. Um, other pros and cons of the airbrush that I want to cover here, because a lot of people ask these questions as well. Um, going down that same line of thought, why why bother if I can do this uh, without an airbrush? Um, one of the one of the nice things about it is that it's not necessarily cheating, but uh, you can really shortcut some of the things that traditionally take some time with a traditional brush. Um, one of the things that I, I use my airbrush to do is to bypass doing uh, gradients on panels and modulation. 
Um, you know, that nice kind of like warping look, the, uh, the slight gradients and stuff like that. Because it's, it's easy and consistent. Um, the airbrush is very good at slowly applying even layers. So that makes a very nice, um, that makes a very nice reason to use the airbrush. But like I said, it's not always appropriate. One of the big cons is that airbrushes don't provide very sharp edging. You have to use something like masking tape or stencils, which are fucking, pardon me, sorry, which are phenomenal tools, good lord. Sorry, tabletop. Um, I use like Tamiya tape, I use painter's tape, I use Silly Putty. Silly Putty's a great tool, uh, parafilm. Uh, things like that. Those are fantastic tools for getting harder edges out, out of uh, airbrushing. So there's good times to use it, good times not to. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Knighthood, you bring up another great um, you bring up another great point with this. Um, batch painting minis is uh, very quick with an airbrush. You can at least get the base coats down and then start hitting the details. Um, if you're if you're interested in doing like three color uh, three color jobs and stuff like that, it's a very very good way to get like the first two to three colors in, and then you can kind of slow roll the rest. Yeah, Maverick, it definitely would. Um, one of the one of the other nice things too is dry brushing by nature is kind of random, which is a good and a bad thing. Um, in some cases, you don't want that randomness. You want a very controlled look. Airbrushing gives you a controlled look. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries, tabletop. Yeah, I, uh, I normally, I normally stream with my mature flag on, but uh, I want to be respectful of other people's streams, of course. So let's let's talk about cleaning the airbrush. We've done some, uh, we've done a little bit of airbrushing. We've got too many started. We did, we did some, uh, we did some priming. Got a nice little prime done on our gutsy chibi. We, uh, we did a zenithal prime and then followed up with uh, a little bit of uh, base coating here on Dorgacon, the demon. And then we actually did a base coat and two gradients on this one. So just showing you very quickly kind of how I get started on minis. You just saw the 90% of this mini. The next parts will be breaking out the bolter, which will probably be done by hand because it's a smaller piece, and then hitting the trim um, maybe adding a little bit of OSL if I feel like it, uh, things like that. And of course, building a base. Uh, bases are also really nicely done. Bases and terrain are great for, uh, for airbrush, um, <clears throat> for airbrush tasks. So now that we're done, uh, we're done painting our minis, we're done with our airbrush. Let's break down our airbrush. So, uh, a lot of times you just saw me put the back on the chassis here a lot of people don't um, paint with the chassis on just because it's easier to clear the airbrush needle without having that in place uh, it, it does kind of change the balance so sometimes I have it on sometimes I, I don't but that's the first thing to take off so if you're cleaning your airbrush for the night you can take this off this doesn't need to be cleaned that's okay uh, this is the nut that loosens the needle so you can see the needle coming out the back here. This is the needle that goes all the way through the brush. We pull it straight out. Now, what do you want to do with the needle? Great question. A lot of people are obviously going to get airbrush cleaner. That's great. It's good to have on hand a little bit of airbrush cleaner. The good news, 90% of what you're going to be doing is with water. So if you have flowing water, normally I take this to my restroom and I do it on the side of the sink. Be very careful dropping parts. Um, I'll run it under a little bit of water, and then I will uh, I'll draw it along a uh, a paper towel like this, and I kind of twist it, and I'll I'll cradle it between my fingers and twist it, and that will get most of the paint off. Uh, if I need to if I need to get something a little bit stronger, sometimes I'll uh, uh, I'll get a little bit of the airbrush cleaner. That's all. But you can see it knocked a little bit of a uh, little bit of paint off the needle there, so we're good. Um, now, how much of this do you actually need to disassemble besides the needle? This is the spring assembly. This, what's, this is what makes the trigger go back and forth. Oops, and that's the trigger. Uh, we don't need to remove this. We also don't need to remove the trigger, but it fell out. Not a big deal. We put that to the side. Uh, the main thing that we want to want to clean here is up front, though. This is where all of our paint is involved. Now, this particular brush, uh, this is technically two parts. This is the uh, 
this is like the uh, the spray cap, and then this is the guard. Um, I actually need to get these two things apart. I don't know what I did to get them so stuck together, but they're kind of stuck at the moment. Uh, you want to take these off, give them a nice uh, nice clean. Make sure there's no dry paint here. Um, I'll actually want to brush that out a little bit. Uh, one of the one of those wire brushes. A lot of people use them on stuff like this. Toothbrush, again, great tool here for that. So you want to clean that. It's clean enough for my purposes right now. This is the, um, uh, I can never remember the, the part. This is the part where the actual air, this, this directs the air. So if you see in here, these three holes, the air comes in through those holes from around here. So the air comes through this hole, then out these three holes and around this, and the needle pokes through and the paint comes through there. So if there's any paint here, make sure to clean it out, but it should be fairly clean. And then this is the tip itself. So this is usually the part that's the gross. You'll want to clean this out, uh, run a little bit of water through it. You can see that just got a little bit of water out. We'll soak that out with a little bit of the uh, paper towel here. Another thing that a lot of people do, and they'll usually take an old needle if they can, they'll take the needle here and they'll push it through the tip just to make sure that there's no paint and it looks like our tip is clear so we're good make sure there's no paint in here I usually thumb it out with a little bit of a paper towel this is a soft paper towel so these are nice if you have like chamois or something extra nice anything that doesn't have fiber is preferable if you get fibers in here it can actually cause a clog so just keep that in mind um, you'll want to thumb that out rinse this out with water very well if you can There we go. Make sure there's no paint in here either. This is where everything comes through. And now I'm basically done. The other thing that... Oh, I don't have it up here. Uh, I put it back in the restroom. Shoot. Okay. So the other thing that you'd want to do when you're putting this all back together, you're like, all right, we've got everything clean. And we're putting things back together. Let me put the trigger in here. It's a little bit annoying on this one. go like, all right everything's clean everything's nice uh, before you put the needle back in uh, you'll want to lubricate the needle so there is airbrush lubricant it's a silicon oil um, I get some from Awada there's super lube Badger has some called reg dab uh, there's a bunch of different things some people suggest uh, uh, suggest what is it uh, hops number nine it's a, it's a firearms oil I I don't necessarily recommend that because it does eat certain plastics um, so be careful of what lubricants you use but silicon oil works just fine put a little bit from about here to here just like a little wick you can wipe off some of the excess and then run it in here and I would put it in and draw it back and forth once or twice that'll lubricate your needle that helps with clogs and things like that tighten the nut put this back on and you're good to go and if it makes you feel better, if you're just putting this on a holster, fill it with water and put it to the side. That's all you got to do to clean your airbrush. So, um, I don't think there's anything else I specifically wanted to cover with you all. I know that's a lot of info. I know there's a lot of stuff in there. Hopefully, hopefully most of that made sense. And uh, if anybody is following along at home, uh, hope, hopefully they didn't get stuck at any point, but if you have any questions, uh, or any more questions, I'd love to hear them. I'd love to take some. It would be fantastic at this point. I'm trying to think of some other good examples or uh, things to point out, some good caveats, especially for beginners. But uh, one of the... I guess one of the big things to point out, uh, airbrushes are really good for larger minis. Um, a lot of people use them for vehicles, just to make the large panels a lot easier. Uh, obviously, if you've been into scale modeling or historicals before, you'll probably be pretty familiar with what people do with uh, their tanks and uh, cars and stuff with an airbrush. So if you if you really want to if you really want to exploit that in like miniature wargamings. Uh, war gamings, war games, uh, things like uh, 
things like uh, artillery and stuff really play well. I, I've done this. Uh, which one is this? This one's actually uh, the green on here is airbrushed without anything else. So if you're kind of curious, the uh, what, what level of airbrushing or uh, to what extent you can airbrush a mini before you start breaking into things, that's that's kind of where you can take it. And then you need to really start detailing out the airbrushing. So adding a lot of detail will take that airbrush step to the next step. Um, so this one's been airbrushed. This one's had the airbrushing detailed with a little bit of edge highlighting. Storing your airbrush when not in use. Nighthood, great question. So if you have... Um, if you've bought an airbrush, uh, a lot of them come with a case, at least, you know, like foam and something like that. That's a great place to start. Foam's a great, uh, foam's a great storage for it. Make sure that if you're putting it away that it is dry, obviously from old and mildew. So like my, my infinity comes in a case like this. Uh, my Awada comes in a similar case with, with, uh, push foam. Um, you can just put it right back in here. That works great. These are also good to hold on to for travel. So if you happen to just travel or need to go somewhere, hold on to those. Um, I also tend to put my manuals in them as well. Besides that, I have a, um, gosh, I wish I could show you guys here. This will help. I have a, uh, I have a couple of airbrush holders off to the side. I get this loose. Yeah, I can. Um, Normally, I just keep my airbrushes on the holsters. So if you're curious what the holster looks like, here's here's one of my holsters. This clamps onto my desk, and then the airbrush sits here. Like this. And I just sit it there. And uh, like I said, I never, I never want to let it, anything sit in there dry. So if it's on the holster, I usually put water in it. If it's on there for a couple of days, I might come back and put more water in it. Some people will actually submerge their entire airbrush and just keep it submerged the entire time. Um, it's it, it all goes back to the trick. If you, if you don't let anything dry in it, it, it won't get clogged. Do I use stencils? Oh, tabletop game and hobby. Do I use stencils? I don't even use... I, I don't just use stencils. I make my own stencils. It's fantastic. I love stenciling. Let me show you some of my wares. So, stencils are a great secondary... Um, secondary skill to pick up uh, if you're using airbrushing uh, as, a, as a primary technique, especially on larger things you get to play around with. Uh, I've recently done terrain with hazard stripes. I've done a lot of um, uh, a lot of vehicles, etc. We were just using some of our hazard stripe stencils here from Death Ray Design. So these are some prefab stencils. Um, and we did some hazard stripes on a pair of ambots here, so you can see on their shoulders, those are stencils. Stenciling is fairly easy as far as application. It takes a little practice to make sure that it's even, uh, etc. But, um, when, um, when you're looking at some of the larger things, um, especially when you're looking at, like, Warhammer or... Um, like even like especially historical stuff. If you want to uh, if you want to transfer things on like markers and numbers and stuff like that, stencils can come in really handy. Um, I I cut my own stencils using something called frisket paper, or I'm sorry, frisket film. So here's a good example. Um, here's a nice little caduceus cut out of frisket film. This is a low adhesive, uh, transparent film. So it's on a backing right now. And uh, I use a uh, I use a I, I use a uh, cutting machine to design these digitally. So you can make your own. You can design. Uh, you can get some prefabs, and you can even make some out of stuff like this. This is a lingerie cleaning bag. So this is meant to clean um, delicate laundry. And I cut up the bag, and I use this as a stencil to make a, a, a scaling pattern. So there's a lot of great homemade uh, material or home materials that you can use to make your own stencils as well. Uh, what what games do I play? Awesome question. Um, tabletop gaming hobby. I play uh, Warhammer 40k. I don't know if I'd call that my primary right now, but it's definitely my big painting project. I love I love painting and playing everything Chaos. Um, 
my my more recent things, I've been getting into Necromunda. Uh, I've been building up and getting ready to play that at some point. I've been doing that for like over a year now. That's been fun. And then uh, my big jam over the past year, uh, I've been painting and playing Judgment, and Judgment is a blast. Uh, I'd love to talk to you guys more about Judgment. I am the studio artist for Judgment, just saying. But if you're wondering where Dorgacon came from, the uh, the demon that we had out earlier, he is also from Judgment. Will I do an airbrushing 201? I would love to. If you if you all would lo if you all would have me, I would love to come back and talk more. I uh, I obviously stream on my own channel as well. So if you if you would ever want to hop in and ask questions, I'd love to. But doing something a little bit more structured and a little bit more uh, formatted and something you all can follow along with, I'd love to. Yeah, Judgment is a gorgeous game, um, and it's 54 millimeter, which is that's a that's actually another great thing to bring up. So uh, we're talking, and we had just talked about some smaller stuff with Warhammer being on the 32 millimeter scale. Um, airbrushing really pays off in dividends on larger scale projects. Judgment is definitely a big one that pays. Uh, pays off with the scale of things. Let me move some stuff around here so I can share. Um, I've actually been working on this. This is a work in progress, but we, we did the skin color on the Hellhound that this goblin is riding using pretty much just the airbrush. Uh, we did it once, and then we went back in and redid the color because we weren't happy with it. So... That was, that was really easy, and the biggest thing that I got out of it is that the large muscles and the large textures on this mini uh, were big enough for me to get the airbrush to and really play around with. So there was enough room to really show off the, the highlights and stuff. If it were smaller, I would probably rely on some different techniques, um, something like shading and glazing, uh, using some washes, etc., rather than relying on the airbrush. Another good example, uh, I started work on this some time ago, and I still have to get back to work on her. This is uh, Akito from Neko Galaxy. The skin tone was airbrushed in, and we started, uh, we started uh, filtering the colors on her skin, her jacket, and uh, her bikini using the airbrush. But we'll need to go back in and finalize out those highlights regardless using the traditional brush. We'll, we'll want to we'll get some specular highlights We'll want to glaze those in and get some differentiation in on like her arm and her jacket. So that's it, it does pay off because it makes that a lot easier. Um, but I, I've still got a lot of work to do after the fact. Uh, looking into Frostgrave and Oathmark for fantasy wargaming. Nice. I've heard a lot of good things about Frostgrave. I have not played though. I have not heard about Oathmark though. Drawn the larger minis just for you to paint. I can understand that. Um, Judgment's been a big thing. I've been breaking out some of my larger Warhammer minis for the same reason. I, I really like, like painting those kind of medium to large scale projects. They uh, not not just because they're they're great to airbrush on, but because the difference in uh, in scale can cause a lot of. Um, It can really shift how you think about your approach to a mini. So it's good practice. I'm trying to think if there's any other really great advantages or topics or kind of caveats that I'd love to point out here. But I think I'm kind of out of things. Um, if you do have any particular questions about any of the products, techniques, etc. that I've used, please feel free to reach out to me. I know that Tabletop Game and Hobby carries most of what I use here because I use them to stock up. Um, so uh, if they don't have it, I can at least give you an equivalent as well. And besides that, I think I think we're at a good point. Shall we go ahead and wrap it out, everyone? We shall. All right. All right. Yes, and that's a that's a great point. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I am on the Tabletop Game and Hobby Discord. I'm unfortunately a Northlander, so 
it's a it's a bit of a drive for me to get out to the the shop so i'm not out there as frequently as i'd like to be but um i do i do try to stop in every once in a while for a uh uh, for a bit of uh, supplies, so once this whole craziness settles down and things get back to a little bit more normal, hopefully I can go out and get some games with you all. Love to play some Judgment or some Necromunda with somebody. Besides all that, have a great evening. Thank you so much, and uh, I'd love to join you all again for another one of these.